All right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Alex, and uh, I don't know if everyone knows me. I'm a doctor is kind of a server thing. I'm normally in the desktop space, but I've been at Red Hat for 12 years or whatever, so I've done other stuff too. Uh, but I'm here to talk about Docker, and I'll, I want to start with some of the history. It's not really a lot of history. It's less than a year old. It grew out of the uh, Dot Cloud Inc. company. It's just a it was a startup that was doing a platform as a service thing, and it they had a lot of users that wanted to look at their code, but their code base was inherently tied to their internal infrastructure. So at some point, they decided to basically rewrite the core of it in an open source fashion, and that was basically started a year ago. And in March last year, was the first public release or even a first public demo of it. And since then, it just snowballed into this enormous thing where all our you know, Red Hat customers come to us and want this, and everyone on the net is just super hyped about it. And you know, lots of people work on it upstream, and lots of people blog about it. And so there's this question there, right? why, why is this huge? Containers are not new per se. I mean, the technologies behind them are something that's been slowly emerged over the time, but suddenly everyone is using this. And uh, I believe there are three main reasons why, why this is so huge. First of all, it solves yeah, an, an actually very important problem that people had. And I want to talk about that first. And then secondly, it's because the UI or command line interface or whatever is just very simple to use so that you know, average developers have no problem using it. And third, it's very efficient in terms of what you would call the competition being some kind of virtualization. But y you would see it's just vastly faster than virtualization unless, and if, if containers is good enough for what you need. So, about the problem that we're trying to solve. It used to be that app deployment was easy. Well, that wasn't easy, but you had a server somewhere in the closet, some guy installed the latest operating system on it, and you installed your app on it, and it ran. And if it didn't, you went down there and like did some tweaking, and then it worked again. But over time, things have got, has gotten way more complicated. Like you have the the application stack got much more complicated. You still need a basic OS, but there are all these layers. You need like a, maybe a JVM or some other kind of language. You may, may need a separate web service for static content. You need a front end, maybe J Node.js or Ruby on Rails and whatever language that pulls in. And you need a database and the database connection layer that matches your front end and you need your code and your content, and all that has to be installed, not only in the server in the closet, but also in all these other places. Like, you, you want to have it on your laptop while you're playing with it. You know, QA wants it. You want it, you want it on the server machine, but you also want, maybe want it at the customer service server, maybe in the public cloud, maybe in your own cloud, or, or a cluster, and you just, all these issues, that you regularly have gets way more complicated when you have this matrix of com you know, complex um, you know, multiplication of the previous things. So you have to install the software. It has to be the right version. It has to be configured to find each other. And testing that you do on it has to be applicable to whatever you're eventually going to deploy. It can't be that you test on something and then you know, run some script and on, on a uh, deployment ma machine, and then you end up with a completely different state than what you tested. So the Docker people like to compare this to the, uh, the shipping industry. Uh, that's actually why the, what, what, what the name Docker means. A Docker is someone who works at the docks, 
and he knows all about cargo and various shipping modes and knows that whenever you want to move cargo from somewhere, some kind of shipping mode to another, you have to handle it in speci special ways. Like you can't put the coffee next to the smelly thing. How would you best stack barrels? How, how tight can you, uh, how deep can you stack something before it breaks? All kinds of, and, and these are all different for the different modes of transportation. So there's, there's a lot of intelligence going on in how to handle this. And th there is a lot of knowledge at the shipping level. But in the 60s, someone figured out a solution for this, which is called the International Shipping Container. And what it helps is that it gives a separation of concern where, where the user of shipping in general doesn't have to know anything other than the container. So he only cares about stacking his stuff in the best way inside the container. And, and the shipper doesn't have to care about what's in there, you know, how, where he can sh put it or anything about it. All he knows that he is able to ship containers matching the spec, and uh, all the shipping modes are optimized to, to only handle this particular type of cargo. So what we want is the equivalent in terms of software. We want to have a separation of concerns where the developer, he only cares about the inside of the container. He wants his code there. He wants his dependencies, his libraries, his configuration, his data set up in a way that he knows works. And he doesn't want to care about how the, the, the server works. For the developers, all the servers are, look the same. They're all Docker containers. Now, on the operation side, they don't particularly want to know what kind of version of Ruby your app is written in, as long as they can deploy, manage, get logs from, monitor your containers. They can instantiate them, stop them, you know, make sure that they are put in the right place on the network, etc. So there's this separation of concerns uh, that allows this to be much more efficient. And, and there's this isolation here, which is the Docker layer. Um, so I want I want to do a live demo later. I hope the demo gods are nice to me. But first, I want to talk a bit about the glossary that Docker uses. It's somewhat like what you use in in the virtualized and the, the VM space. Like image is something they use. It's not exactly the same as in the VM space, but some, something like it. An image is a, is a passive entity. It's, it's a template that you can create a container from. So it has all the files that you need. So, so basically, it's got the full file system that the uh, container will run in. But it also has metadata about, about the container, like what's the default binary to start when you start the container which port are exposed and who made this container and things like that. So here we have, for instance, we, we have the host operating system and, and it could be whatever. It could be like rel or fedora or something. And we have it in here a root Debian image. And then the container is based on a particular image. So you instantiate an image and it turns into a container. But the container is, is a, it's a process, it's a live entity. It's connected to a specific, a specific node. It's generally a single process or like a herd of processes like the Apache forking daemon. It's not generally a full operating system. So it's not like a VM where you would have a init system, a hardware extraction, UDEV and all sorts of stuff running. It is basically only one process. And it's isolated from the host system. So it, so it sees it's, it believes it's alone in the universe, basically. And it's cheap, uh, both in terms of RAM, but in terms of disk, and in terms of 
being very fast to spin up and kill. It also, so if you look here, the container is like a writable thing above the image that allows it to modify the image. So it looks like it can write to its full file system. Uh, what happens is that it only stores the difference between the, the base image. And so you can start up a base image, install something on it, and end up in a state that you think is interesting. And then you can commit the state, which basically takes the container and turns it into an image. So there's, there's something called layers. It's kind of an internal thing. It's not really visible in the UI. But every time you commit a container, you create a separate layer in the, uh, in the image. So an image only contains the delta against the, the layer below it. So anything, uh, anything starting up a container based on this image will be sharing the base files from the base image with other containers, even if they're not using the, the layers above. So the base image is kind of special in that you have to basically pay from outside of Docker and import it. So <coughs> in technical terms, how does it work? There, there are several technologies that have slowly landed in the adoption kernel for the last, the last five years or so. There's cgroups, which is a way to, to group processes in trees. So the important thing is you can group the processes of a container so that you can treat them as a single entity. You can kill them all, you can you know, make sure they don't ex escape from their group, and you can apply resource, resource management and stuff, and, and limitations of you know, what devices you can use and things like that. There's namespaces. There's actually several types of namespaces. Um, for instance, the network, file system, the pid namespace. These are the things that isolate uh, the container from the system. So the, uh, I guess the simplest one is the pid file system. It gives every process inside the namespace its own view of the set of processes in the system. and what pids they have. So to start a container, the first process inside the container would be pid1. At least that's what it thinks its pid is. And it will see no other processes. But if you look at the process from the outside of the container, it will have a different pid. So the pid is per namespace. And, uh, the, the set of processes that you see when you look in slash proc is different. It's basically a subset of, of the parent namespace. The same with network, you get your own interfaces, your own, uh, your own file system, your own root, your own set of mounts, etc. And then there's the layer stuff. There, we use various technologies for, for, for doing the layering. The initial version of Docker used called something called AUFS, which is a uh, union file system. Unfortunately, it's, I guess it's not very good. It's, it's, it's not likely to be upstream. It, it is in the uh, Ubuntu kernel. I think they actually removed it in the latest release. Uh, but for, for the longest time, it, they, the Ubuntu people carried it for their live CD support. Uh, but it's not going upstream. So we need, uh, and it definitely is not in RHEL or Fedora. So we needed something that worked on Fedora. So I wrote backends using Device Mapper, which is the basically using the pin provisioning module of LVM. And I also wrote a battery FS backend that uses subvolume snapshot. Both these allow similar kind of copy and write of, a, of a, an entire image. They're different in that the device mapper one works on the block level, and the other one works more at the file system level. But in practice, they give about the same behavior. So now I'm going to challenge the gods here. And see if we can do a demo of this. Okay, so whoa. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. So every everything starts with the Docker command. 
kind of like git. So there's Docker and then command. Command is most common command is, is run, which restarts the container. We have to specify a uh, container or an image to run based on. And then what we want to run inside the container. So this is this would basically create a new Fedora. I have an image called Fedora, it's Fedora 20. Uh, I think they, they always know it's Fedora 19, but the image is Fedora 20. So we'll create a new root for it, uh, a fresh minimal Fedora 20 installation that you can write to, and run this command in there, and it's pretty fast. I think it's, yeah, two, three hundred milliseconds. It's not as fast as running Echo, but it's vastly faster than starting up a, a virtual machine or something like that. I also have a bunch of images here. So there's basically there's some Ubuntu, Fedora, VistaBox, CentOS. Um, I, so I can easily run, say, an Ubuntu. And that, that would spin up a completely fresh Ubuntu instance. So uh, Fedora. So it's very isolated from the uh, host system. I mean, they do share the kernel, so it's not like a it's not like a virtualized environment where you can do anything you want. It has to be a Linux to run on the same kernel as the host. It's also the case that if you don't have an image locally and you run it, so I don't have something called Vistabox, I think I don't. But when it can't find it, there's this public index, it's called a public index, which is kind of like GitHub where anyone can you know, push their images and we can easily download them. So. You can also use a local registry where you have your internal images, but it's, it's a really nice way to, if you're a maintainer of a project, you can manage your own images upstream and anyone can just use them. And a, a bit more, I can run interactive commands, which gives a nice view of the inside of the container. So this, this is basically, I'm attaching to the shell inside the container. So it, it, th this is what it thinks it's running on, right? Th there's nothing going on here. And the, the network interface it sees is a fake one that's bridged to the real one. And, you know, Kind of a minimal. I mean, it's not super minimal. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's got like 100 patches or something. But it's enough so that you can build your own package on top of it. So, interactive views is something you might be using when you're playing with Docker, but the most common use of Docker is as a server. <coughs> so, if we run as a server here, we Let's, let's do the most stupid server ever. So, so uh, def D is run this the patch. So it gave me the uh, the, um, the 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 ID of the Docker process. You can see. Uh, using Docker D is that this is running actually like the the, uh, the container ID here is very large but it's, it's the same way as Git you can you can uh, type as few characters needed to make it unique when you want to refer to it so you can do docker log on that and like or two and it would show you the output to it can attach to it 
what what happens to them. The monitoring standard hours, standard errors, the best. And, and yeah, Docker V shows you what happens. There's also Docker V if, if you compare all the containers, it's kind of interesting. Even the ones that exited that I ran before are still around, although they're not normally shown. So you can see that Docker tracks their exit status, but they also keep the entire state around, which is kind of important because, you know, first of all, you might, you know, accidentally exit some path or something. Then you can just restart that particular container, which is just restart the binary in the same state that it was in. But it's also important because that's what lets you run a command and then later commit the container. Because if you deleted the state when it exited, you, you wouldn't be able to commit it. Um, so I want to try to demo setting up a, uh, a container. And, and this is not how you would normally use to do it. But I'm doing it manually just to show you how it works. So let's uh, create a web server and, and do it manually. And we want to want it to be it, we want it to expose port 80. This is the so inside here we have no web server, but we had enough of a system that we can install one. We have jam and the right settings. We could just run. Yay, demo does work. Uh, so th that installed that, and then, and then we can get some content and run cd. Normally, Apache is a forking daemon. Generally, when you're writing demons, you want them to run in the foreground because the whole container exits when, <coughs> when the, when the you know, pig one exits. And so you want the, the first persons to live as long as you, you can let them live. So now we have a container running there. And we can see it's a beach docker ps that it actually has, like a mapping of port 80 inside the container is 49 lines IP. So we can so you can see it, it's accessible here. And, and that's the only port that it's accessible. And, and if you want, you can control to what, when we run the command, what kind of server port it maps to. But if you don't, uh, Docker will just pick a random one, and then you know you can put your orchestration into Docker to figure out where, where it eventually uh, what kind of port it got assigned to. So let's yeah. Another thing is we can see we can diff the container. shows all the changes that happened inside the container since the base init. And we can uh, we can commit we can commit that container. It generates a new image. We can call that this is very similar to git if you ever use that. We can call it then we can easily, if we exit this thing, we can just do docker run port 80 and put the cd and then it should be cd. That just spun up a new one. That, that, that way we manually constructed a container. And we can easily spin up multiple of them with just a single command. But that's not maybe normally how you do uh, images. 
there's, there's something called Docker Pile that uh, is used to, cre to create containers. And this Docker Pile essentially does exactly what I did manually, where basically every row is, is a container that started based on uh, the image that was created from the container on the line above. So it, it's It starts with from Fedora, meaning that the, the base image is, is the Fedora one, and then it runs this command, which basically is modify the metadata of the container, and then it commits that, and then it creates a new one, and a new container, in, in that container it runs this, it commits, etc. So if I just run, You can actually see if on every line what the, the ID of the container is, and then, uh, oh, it's got a cache. Oh, I, I guess I ran this before. That was not a good demo. Oh. Anyway, I mean, it normally it would run all the commands, but the second time you run it, if the, if the um, operation and the um, base image are the same, the results should be the same, so it just uses the cache, so that this time this was really fast, the first time it would have taken a bit longer. Uh, and the interesting thing is then if you, if you do a change at the end of the file, rebuilding it is really fast because all the previous layers are cached. Of course, this you, you can disable the cache if you want because maybe the first command is jump update and you run it at a later time because you want it like the newer one. But difference here is that it, it sets the default command here, so it sets part of the metadata, so now I can just do docker run 80, but they're actually on different ports. Um, you can easily. Yeah. Well, I think that's hard. Okay, so uh, some more topic that I don't really have time to demo. Uh, the uh, the index, uh, which is what I use to pull the Bizzlebox stuff from, it's actually very similar to GitHub in that you can go there, there's a website, you can store your images and you know see which ones are popular, there are lists of the current ones, the most recent ones, you can comment on them and you can create your own user and so my name is Alex L on the index, so any 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 image that's Alex L slash something is my image, and anyone, if I pu push something there, anyone can pull it. Uh, you can use your private registry, so instead of using the public one, you can set up a private server that acts similar to the index that you can use specify instead of just the name of the of the image, you use kind of a ho the host name of the registry slash name of the image that would just connect to your local registry using HTTP. And there's a uh, open source Python based registry implementation so that the Docker people wrote that I believe it's in Fedora now, so you can just install it and run it. Th there's something called volumes. All of this copy on write snapshotting stuff is nice for the root file system, but if you have a lot of data, like say uh, the, the actual database or some kind of write mostly, uh, or write, writable data that is part of your application, then you want to use something called volumes. And volumes are basically 
host directories that gets mounted into your container. And, and, and additionally, it, it's a good way to share data between containers. So you can have the same volume in multiple containers. In fact, you can start a container and, and say, I want all the volumes that this other name container has, which is a great way if you're starting a new container base to replace the existing one because you have an update or something, you would automatically inherit all the database and all the files and stuff. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you saw it, but if you do Docker PS, in addition to the, the, the weird, weird long hex code, there's a readable name and it, if you don't give it a name, it like makes up funny ones. I don't know if anyone saw it, but you're insulting Torvalds or whatever. Uh, but you can name your uh, containers like for what servers they do. You can call them web server if you have a web server. And it makes it easy to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, well, you can use that instead of the long name. But you can also use it when you, li when you link another container to a running container, which is something called link. So what, so what you often have is some kind of database that runs as the backend for a web service and the, you want the web service to connect to the database container. And if you do that by links, then every, every port that is exported by the, by the database container will automatically get <coughs> linked into the, uh, the container that uses the, the, the database and various environment variables would appear that makes it really easy to, to find your way back to the uh, database, like I think there's the name of the thing you link to, underscore port and underscore IP is the way you find the, the other things. And that way you can very dynamically, you, know, you, you can move to a different database and everything in the user of the database will stay the same <laughs> as long as the name of the link container is the same. Um, the base image are kind of special in that they're not created inside Docker. There's multiple ways to create them. You can use, for instance, the JOM way to, to specify a root that you install into. Uh, in Fedora, we use the Fedora build system. It has a we call image factory that we use to build all sorts of images. But basically what you do is create a separate directory of your thing and you tar it up and then there's a docker import command that basically where you hand over a tar file and that creates an image. I guess that's okay. Yeah, well, right now, uh, which kind of login, first of all? Yeah, so, so the Apache logs are separate things. They're yeah, so the, the, the question was, what about logging? And th there are multiple kinds of login. There's syslog, which you can easily do whatever you want with. I mean, you can mount the real syslog into your container and get syslog out. Standard out and standard error is currently piped into the Docker daemon, which uh, caches it locally. And there has been talk upstream about having some kind of plugin model where you can extend the logging to match various logging systems. But right now it just stores it and you can access it using the Docker logs command. Something like Apache logs, however, those are generally written you know, outside of standard logging is in their own. So those would appear in the container. I mean, of course it depends on the, how you set it up. You could like set a volume for the logging and then those would be shared between different instances. Or you could just ignore the logging and store it per, per, per container and look in, in the container for the logs. <coughs> uh, there's no, there's actually upstream work going on 
expecting how logging should work in general. It's not a very solved issue right now. Yeah, if you do like dash p ad colon ad, it will get port ad on the host system. No, uh, the idea is that uh, firewall is part of the operations, not part of the uh, container itself. So Docker by default set up sets up a a bridge, bridge network with a firewall on every container that blocks anything but port, the exposed ports. But you can manually set up your own bridge and set up whatever network. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you can't really. Um, net, net filter is not namespace in that. It's not namespace base aware in that sense. The, 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 uh, the IP tables configuration is global, it's not per. So it, was, it would be unsafe to have the container modify the global IP table state. I mean, it's. Yeah. I, I think it would be hard from a security perspective to allow the container to modify the IP table state because I mean, it could just drop all rules, and that will affect the host also. I mean, it, yeah. Think that the No, no, I mean, so far I haven't heard of any, but we require a pretty recent kernel because we're, because of all the namespace stuff that, I think the upstream recommendation is 3.8. So there's not been a lot of KABA changes since 3.8. But you might run into issues if you run a really old distro on it. But, but in general, it's not a huge problem because what we run inside the container is the single service that you want to run, and, and the KABI issues are more likely to hit uh, the plumbing side of the OS. Like, UDEV might require some new things. Systemd requires some new things. Apache rarely use complex kernel ABIs. So I don't think in practice it will be a huge thing. But sure, I mean, it could be that, you know, something new like ePoll appears and newer kernels and some app requires it and the host kernel doesn't have it. So, so it could happen. But th there's currently no, there's no metadata that allows you to require a certain kernel or anything. On the other hand, you could just check if whatever feature you need is available and fail if you're missing. Yeah, so, so, so the question is a security one. How would you manage this over time as you get security updates? It, it's clearly possible to just run dumb update inside a live container. That's not ideal. So w what would normally happen is that operations knows about a new, uh, a, a new security update that hits the particular container, which is, Here's one of the nice things. The, the set of packages in the container <coughs> is really limited, which you know increases the chances that whatever bug did not hit your container. But, it, but if, if this is like a libc issue where every, everything has to be fixed, what you normally do is just spin up a new build of your image. Right, you basically rebuild the Docker file and create a new image and you test that to make sure that it works. And then when you have a exact binary copy of what 
the working update is, you just instantly switch over from the old container to the new one, and it inherits all the data via volumes and things like that. Okay, so the question was how to do, how to ship finished images, basically, and you can you can either use a uh, local uh, local repository and push to it and then pull it from it from the server, or you can use th there's a way to basically export an image as a file and then you just copy that, however, to the other one and they use Docker import it into the local repository. 